Hebrews chapter 13. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13. So we are in the, uh, you know, the final chapter of this letter that we've been looking at for quite some time. Uh, remembering the context of the author and the, uh, the audience and, uh, you know, just maybe a little extra view. Um, I know Justin's here tonight. I know Jordan wasn't here the last few weeks. But, you know, somebody give us a snapshot, uh, you know, Cliff Notes, Cliff Notes version uh, of Hebrews, of what we've seen maybe, you know, start bite-sized chunks and maybe pass off to somebody else. What's, what's been this thing he's laid out maybe in the first 10 chapters? You know, what's really been his argument or his discourse you know, in this in this sermon, really is what it is. Um, what do you guys think about when you think about it? What's what's it been all about? Brotherly love. What's that? Brotherly love. Okay, brotherly love. Yep, certainly when we start in chapter thirteen, right? That's verse one talks about that. Good. What else comes to mind? Well, I think of the supremacy of Christ. Supremacy of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> ding ding ding. Yeah, good. Good. I, like, I wasn't here. I started, I guess, maybe yeah. halfway, but I would have to go to the, I mean, it starts off very, very strong, you know, talking about how God used to speak to the people, to the prophets and uh, the apostles and how, you know, everything was there. But, you know, it, it clearly starts it off with saying, you know, this is how I did it, but now the new covenant, the resurrection, whatever, now I speak through my son. So yeah. I think to me that's very powerful, yeah. stating that they you know the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ Amen. and nothing else. But Good. Yeah, great point, because that's how he starts the letter off, yeah. you know, is saying, hey, this is what it's all about. And then really that's what the next 10 chapters are about, right? Uh, for 10 chapters, he lays out, you know, I think of the first couple chapters, speaking of, uh, you know, angels and the law. And remember how, you know, the angels were the messengers that brought the law, but it points to Jesus being the, the better messenger with a greater message. You know, he moves on into Moses and Joshua in the promised land. And Moses and Joshua, uh, you know, were leading the people in the promised land, but Jesus is a better leader leading us into a better promised land. Uh, then, you know, think about chapters 8 through 10 and the sacrificial system, right, of the Old Testament. And he talks about those sacrifices, the high priest. Uh, the altar, right, the, uh, the temple, e everything about it was pointing to a better sacrifice, a better high priest, a better altar. Uh, so, you know, so the, the gist of it is, like Rob was saying, the supremacy of Christ, you know, is what I titled it, because that's really the overarching thing, is that Jesus is superior. He's the superior messenger, the prophet, the sacrifice, the high priest. He's the everything you know, and remember who, who Hebrews, right, so it's pointed certainly to all believers you know but it's pointed to jews right and the things that the jews would have that they would be struggling with remember is the baggage they come with being the old testament and be like what do you mean we don't have to make sacrifices anymore right like i think we struggle with that because we've never lived that life of having to go kill animals or take it to the priest and be killed uh, but for them, they grew up in those things and they're like what do you mean i don't i don't have to practice these religious things anymore and, there, and, and he clearly tells us, no, the blood of bulls and goats do not cleanse sin. Only the blood of Christ is the, the sufficient sacrifice to cleanse and wash away sins. And so everything was imagery, right, pointing to Jesus, that the new covenant and the blood of Christ has made obsolete the old covenant in those things, right? Does that make sense? Any, any questions or maybe inputs to add to, to that? Does that make sense? And that, um, you know, as I say that, I think about he's talking to Jews, talking certainly to Gentiles that would have been around listening as well. But, you know, a lot of these letters in the New Testament are written to believers, right? To the church at Philippi, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Thessalonica. Like, these are written to believers, and that's who the Bible is primarily written to. But isn't there also uh, an element all throughout the Bible that is to not unbelievers? The gospel, right? That's how people are saved. they got to hear the message of the truth of the gospel of Christ that saves them. And so, uh, right, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And so in that, we've seen these arguments, right? I think I've called them warnings, these five warnings throughout this, this letter that we've seen where he calls them 
to repent. He calls people who are listening there that you may be walking the fence and you may be caught up in this Jew- Old Testament thing and I'm telling you it's about this new thing. And, and remember he says, uh, you know, consider Jesus. Come to him. Uh, today do not harden your hearts as the people in the wilderness did because they all fell in the wilderness and were punished, right? They did not make it in the promised land. Don't be like them, but believe in Christ and come to him completely and don't be caught up in these things. And so that was a big part of those first 10 chapters. Um, Now that we've gotten into chapter 13, we're really getting into um, application. Thank you. For, uh, you know, there's certainly been, we try to find application every week, right? In anything we do, Bible study here, uh, you know, Sunday morning Bible study that I teach. Steve and Brian are teaching the youth. uh, Sunday sermons that we preach. Like, we want to try to draw application out because it's not just about head knowledge, which is important, the, our knowledge, we are to grow in that, and Paul prays for that for us um, throughout the scriptures, but the point of the knowledge is what? I mean, what should happen when we become more knowledgeable about God? What's like, what should be the natural byproducts of that? That we obey his word. That we obey his word, okay? Evangelism. Okay, we become more Christ-like, evangelism, right, so that we will share the gospel. Yeah, I mean, that's the goal, right, is, is to be, uh, now that we've been saved, we're to grow to be more Christ-like, and we're to, to tell others of the Gospels that they would be saved and become more Christ-like. And so uh, the more knowledge we have, you know, the more equipped we, we should be able to be uh, to, to articulate, you know, good conversations and, and good dialogue with people uh, that may have questions about those things. Uh, again, the food got here a little late. You guys can make your way around, and, on, and we'll, boys, we'll keep talking. But um, so, so now that we've gotten into 13, you know, we get we get into a lot of application uh, with with brotherly love. Um, okay, loving uh, strangers, hospitality to strangers. Talked about marriage there in verse four, keeping the marriage uh, clean and being honored by all. Uh, talked about keeping your life free of the love of money. Remember, and not being covetous, but being uh, content with what God has given us because he is the giver of every good and perfect gift, according to James 1, I think, verse 17. Uh, so, you know, all things come from God, so we should give thanks to him for all things because everything we have is, is his, and uh, we are stewards of it. Uh, then we've moved into, you know, um, remembering your leaders, it says in verse 7. He says, remember those who spoke the word of God to you and how they lived a life of faith before you. And if you have those type of people in your life, mimic them, imitate them, grow to be like them. Look to them as examples and grow to be like them. Um, you know, thinking of first, maybe Second Corinthians 11 or no, First Corinthians 11. Uh, verse 1, where Paul says, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, you know, and I would say the same, you know, any teacher or preacher, I'm going to fail you. I'm just a man, right? But you need to be looking past me to Christ or past your pastor to Christ. Uh, and, 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 you know, remembering that that's, he's the chief shepherd, right? Uh, those of us called to be pastors are just under shepherds. We're just part of the flock also. You know, we're sheep also. And so uh, remembering those leaders who have been been good and you know they've helped you to not be led astray remember by strange and diverse doctrines and guarding against false teachings and trying to help you mature into the 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 real things of of the scriptures and and again just amazing you guys how the lord works because this is where we are yesterday in sunday school where we're in sunday school we're going through ephesians we're in chapter three and we're talking exactly about that how paul says uh i have been chosen by god uh, been given this stewardship of, of the mystery, which is the gospel, uh, to the Gentiles, to the Jews, and that I have been given this responsibility to, to God, uh, being a minister, and then he talks about ministers or pastors being called to preach the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring light to the administration of the mystery. And that's the goal of preachers and teachers. God, you know, Ephesians 4, God has given pastors and teachers to the church for the purpose of building the church up and, and, you know, edifying the church and building us and not just pastors, but all of us. Like somebody said that earlier, we all need one another. We're all gifted in different ways and we need those gifts to be uh, more effective, right? Remember that the church is a body made up of members. It's not a one man show. Literally body parts. Right, literally body parts. 
That's right. Head. And Christ is the head, right? And so we need uh, active body parts. We need the giftedness that each one of us has to come in. I, I need Pete. Pete needs Don. We need one another in our churches. Uh, we need the fellowship. We need the communion with, with one another. Uh, it's not a, you know, uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know, there's Rogue One. This isn't a Rogue One thing. This isn't a Rogue Lone Ranger life that you've been called to if you've been called to, to, to believe in the Christ, in, in the Lord. It's, this is a family business, okay? Uh, this is a, a group thing, and, and we're called to do it together. And so there's a structure and organization to that, and that includes the leaders or the pastors of the church. And, and so where we left off the last couple of weeks was talking about that, um, looking at verse 14. Um, actually, go to 15. It says, Through him, uh, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an, have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for what uh, advantage would that be to you? Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Let's stop there. Father God, thank you so much for this night. Thank you so much for this text. Uh, your word is just such a precious gift to us as it reveals you to us. It, it teaches us. Uh, I pray that your spirit would be our teacher and our guide. Uh, Lord, that you would give us understanding, that you would illumine our minds to, to better understand your, your word, your ways, that we'd be more effective and more efficient for your kingdom, we ask tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's where we've been hanging out and talking. We've seen these three things, and again, it's not an exhaustive list, um, you know, an all-inclusive all list, but we see the idea of these uh, pleasing sacrifices is what I've kind of titled this section we've been talking about. But one of them is right there in verse 15. These pleasing sacrifices are the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So we talked about the lips that give thanks to God. That's what we should be doing as evidence of our salvation. Then in verse 16, we saw, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. So we talked about that a couple weeks ago, the good works. And so somebody remind us about the good works and what is the, the purpose of the good works? Uh, what does um, that look like? Or, and maybe talk about the root and the fruit kind of idea so that we don't get the wrong idea. What is this idea about of good works? Is this talking about you know, good works are the things we got to do to earn salvation. What are we talking about? Uh, I would say, what I, the way I see it is, first of all, the good works, works are dead without faith, and faith is dead without works, right? But the good works are things that are come out of you, but first, you have to be in Christ. You have to, you know what I'm saying? You have to be, I'm not going to say, you know, just saved. You have to be a mature Christian or a mature believer, and then the works would come out, you know, and it, it, it could be, if it's good works, it's, you know, hospitality, helping a brother, crying with a brother, you know, giving your time to somebody. It doesn't have to be that, you know, you go out to an orphan and, sure. you know, save people from cancer. It's just, uh, the, you know, it's going to come out of you because you have that, you know, the, a good tree will not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree will not bear good fruit, so good. it's, you know... Good. I don't know if that's more confusing, so I think I hear Joe saying the good works are not what saves us, because that was a question I posed. I saw some nodding, uh, some shaking heads. So the good works is not what saves us, correct? Okay. So the good works then is is what? He's got a good start there. Anybody want? Sharing the gospel. Okay. Yeah, certainly would be a fruit, right? And a good fruit. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But the good works were put in place before any of us were born even. Okay. Time. Yeah. Good. Ephesians 2.10. Yep. God created us to do good works, which he set for us beforehand to do. Yeah. yeah, so he's called us to the works. And like uh, Jose was saying, you know, the works are not the root. You know, that's kind of what I was talking about. The, the root of your salvation is Christ Amen. by faith and by grace alone. Uh, the fruit or the evidence is the good works, right? And so, so there should be evidence 
you know, of changed life for, for believers. We, we should desire to do good works and to help one another and to share, uh, as it says, what you have. And it says right there in verse 16, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So these are the things that we do as sacrifices, you know, to God. Because, again, why would he use, why would he use uh, terminology like that? Why would he say, you know, these are pleasing sacrifices to God? <coughs> We don't have to sacrifice anymore. Okay, we don't have to sacrifice anymore. But remember, who is his audience? His target audience, primarily, that he's talking to. Jews. Yeah, and so what would they be thinking about? Sacrificial system and all those things. And so he's saying, I don't. I already told you it's not about sacrifices. That all those pointed to Jesus. He made the sacrifice for sin. The sacrifices we make that are pleasing to God are these things. Uh, and then thinking of Romans 12, right? Uh, the first couple verses there, where he says. Um, you know, do not be conformed by this world, you know, or the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind uh, that you will be able to do what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God. Uh, you know, he says to present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, uh, and this is your reasonable service. You know, this is your act of worship, to present yourself as a sacrifice, meaning, uh, you know, does that mean that I got to get up on an altar and kill myself? I mean, what does that mean? Okay. I don't know. That's what it's a good, yeah. It's, good. it's a good part of it. Staying away from sin. I mean, that's a sacrifice right there. Okay. You know, uh, leaning on, on, on God and leaning on the Word of God and not doing the things that you used to do. And you're, I mean, think about it. That is a sacrifice because you did it so easy. You know, somebody stopped smoking. You stop smoking. You remember the old days. You have the urge to still. So you're, you're doing a sacrifice. To sure. Contain yourself from those things. That's good. Good. What else? Maybe encompasses more than that, right? That our whole life is to be yeah. a sacrifice to, to God. That we're to sacrifice ourselves because right. He sacrificed right. Himself for us. Uh, you know, I can't think of who it is now, but uh, you guys, a lot of you guys know me. Know, uh, you know, if I'm exercising or, you know, coaching or whatever, I like to listen to like Christian hip hop, and. Uh, you know, there's a song that says something like, you know, he died for us so we could live for him, you know, uh, and that's the idea, you know, we are to sacrifice and give our lives and everything about it to him and to living for him and, and you know, the things he's called us to. Um, good. And so that was the first two things there. And the third thing we looked at is verse 17. Um, in this list of pleasing sacrifices, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And that's where we left off two weeks ago. We pick up there tonight, just kind of ending, you know, and summing up that that last one. Just say, yeah, uh, obey your leaders and submit to them. Remember, this is talking specifically in the context of the church. So who are the who are these leaders in the church that we are called to obey and submit to? Pastors, okay. overseers. Good. Pastors, elders, ministers, overseers, shepherds, you know, all those words that are used, uh, you know, are talking about the same office, you know, the one office of, of pastor. And so, um, you know, as, as a church, you know, we are called to submit to the leadership of pastors as believers. And so just as God gives an order, God gives an order in all things. If, if you haven't recognized this yet, you will come to recognize this as you mature. Uh, God is a God of order. He sets things straight. He, he is the one who has designed everything, how it's to be, to best glorify him. And so we would be good to honor that, follow that. Think about how he set up the, the, the home. Uh, a man and a woman to be joined together, to be, you know, the two become one flesh. It's a man and a woman. Uh, those lines obviously have been blurred by the secular world we live in and, and broken down, but we do not bend on those things. Uh, and he has designed, you know, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, uh, you know, there's there's a head of the household. It is the, the man who is the head over the woman. There's a submission order here. Uh, even in the Trinity itself, you guys, there's a, an order of submission in the Trinity that Jesus submitted to the Father and, and performing, uh, you know, the duties that he came to be a man and take on the cross. That was in submission to the Father's will. The Spirit, we find, you know, submits to the Father and to the Son. And there's these things that go in there. And that by no means means that the Son or the Holy Spirit are inferior to the Father. Do you see it? 
And so we'll talk about a lot of that more in the home thing in our next study as we're going to talk about, you know, being men of God uh, starting in that next study, study. And so that's fresh in my mind with a lot of studying going on with that for me. But, um, you know, there is this order and structure even to Romans 13, and there's a structure to governance and that we live in, that we are called to submit to the local governments and authorities that are here on this planet, uh, you know, because God is the one who's put them in place for a purpose, and he's the one doing it. And so, therefore, we are to honor that and go with that. Um, so, in the church, he is also orchestrated in an order of pastors, uh, you know, two offices in the church being pastors and deacons. And the pastors are the preachers, the teachers, you know, the spiritual shepherds. And so, in that, uh, you know, believers are to submit to the authority of the pastors. Um, I do want to clarify this point because we have a couple guys that weren't here when we said it a couple weeks ago. Uh, but just, again, it's a good point to remember. This really speaks to, uh, you know, I want to make a point about the local church. Because if we're talking about the big C church, if you will, all believers in the world, right? They are the church, right? Is everybody with me? Everyone who believes in Christ by faith is a part of the church, right? The big C church. So, you know, Rob goes to the church down the street. Shannon goes to another church down the street. We come to this church. He goes to that church but yet we're all part of the Big C Church if we're believers, right? Everybody's with me? But we're part of different local churches because of different doctrinal distinctives and like-mindedness and things like that, and that's okay. However, that's how we know that's, this is what he has to be speaking to. And, and we see throughout the scriptures, Paul tells men to go and to set up elders in the churches, meaning plural. And so my point is that as a, as a believer, who is it? that Jordan, being a believer, or Pete being a believer, is supposed to submit to under their authority? Is, is Jordan and Pete supposed to submit to every single person in the world that calls himself a pastor? That's clearly not the context. Me as a pastor, uh, it, says, it says here, they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. I will give an account for every single person that I under shepherd and that I teach and preach and, and oversee. So does that mean as a pastor that I'm, uh, that I'm going to be held accountable for every believer on the planet? That, is, that can't be the context. So we, if I want you to see the importance and significance of the local church here, uh, that you know he is called, Rob is called to submit to the elders and authorities at his church, and they give account for him. You who are part of the, the flock and the body here, uh, you know, you guys are called to submit to me and to Steve and to Brian, and the three of us will give an account for those that we oversee. Does that make sense? That uh, which, which certainly speaks a lot to the things we're talking about, because you're not to submit, and I'm not to submit to all these other men. You know, so you need, you need to see the importance in this of where you go to church, why these things are important, who you're submitting to, who, who you're, you know, uh, covenanting into agreement with as the body that you're going to, these things are significant and important. And, and so in that, I want you to see that that's in here. So you're like a, a previous employer on our resume, and God's going to read it and give you a call and be like, hey, how, how was he? Like, He's, and the bigger thing is, yeah, it's a, kind of. it, it, yeah, it's a kind of a decent analogy. And James talks about that, you know, that he says, well, and others too, you know, saying, speaking, Paul says that it is, uh, you know, if a man desires the, the pastoral ship or the, the office of elder is a good thing, uh, but know that it's a difficult thing. James says not many of you should be teachers and do this because you'll be whole, high, highly accountable. There's a greater judgment, he says, to this. And so those things should weigh heavy on pastors and teachers, uh, and it's a big deal. And, and so I would say that and challenge that to each one of you here who may be a father, uh, that you are the priest of your small flock that you have been called to under shepherd, and you will be accountable for what you do with that. And I pray that that puts the fear of God in you because it puts the fear of God in me having the call like that as a father and even more so as the under shepherd for other souls and other people. It's, these are big, heavy things that, that should be weighty on us to be mindful of, ooh, I should be above reproach. Oh, I should be maturing and I should be mindful of these things because these things are significant and I one day will give an account for these things. I was just going to say that the, um, the whole flock and shepherd thing is so appropriate because people are grazing in the same field 
But we're still going to go back to our shepherds because they're looking after us. Mm. And they know their voice. You know, and that's, that's yeah. it's the whole thing is based upon this simplest thing that how Jesus speaks to speak past people who have got these gigantic yes. brains or whatever and making their own mind. No, you go here or whatever. And it's 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 such beautiful simplicity. Really, yeah. You know? For dummies like me, Pete. It's made yeah. for dummies like me. Yeah. yeah. Bar, bar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, man. Good. So, so in in conclusion to kind of that point, you know, that believers are to submit to the authority of the pastors, you know, that they are called to submit to and that they will submit to. And, and that authority, remember you guys, uh, this authority isn't any authority that I demand or that a pastor demands. Uh, this is an authority that the scriptures have given. The only reason the pastors have any authority is because it's been derived from the scriptures, because it's been given to them in God's word. And that's the only reason. There's no reason that you should submit to me, period. The reason you should submit to me, if you, know, if you submit to me and you're a member here, is because God calls you to do that. And same for Steve and Brian. Um, and so, you know, the pastors are to submit to God's authority, right, and the authority given to them by God in his word, and they will answer accordingly to that. And that's, that's going to be a big deal. Yeah. It's a lot easier when you lead like Jesus. Amen. Indeed. That's why we need to strive to do that. Yep. Yeah, indeed, man. Yeah, remembering that the pastors are not responsible and accountable to the church. That's an upside-down idea, and there's a lot of churches that are led that way, to say, you know, oh, well, we can kick out a pastor whenever we want, or we have a board or a trustee board or something like this. Pastors are not accountable to the church. Pastors are accountable to God, and they are responsible for the church, okay? And so that's a, that's a high calling and a, a high accountability and a big responsibility, okay? Um, so, again, 1 Corinthians 11, one we talked about earlier, but uh, submit to the pastors that, that you're under, you know, as they submit to god's word and to the authority of the scriptures you know if if you are at a church where you know pastors are struggling with doing that then it's going to be a struggle for you you know and it and it should be yeah, yeah there's too many people coming up with too many ideas right like you know when you have a committee and you have this and that everybody has their own view so it's supposed to be god the pastor submits to god to the word and that's it. There's no, there's a, sure. We see where some churches, you know, they're like, you know, what color are we going to paint this? I don't sure. Like this, so what happened? Well, oh, don't get me wrong. We could get on a whole side trail of yeah, that. No, and no, so, no, no, and no. I don't want to advocate, though, that I'm saying, no, but, you know, oh, churches that have committees and all these boards no, are wrong. Because I, I understand, look, there's, there is a, you know, for lack of a better term, let's just call it a, a, a business side of, you know, an organizational side of the things that, that go around in an in a organization like a church. And I especially think about the bigger you got, the organizational thing structure, right, uh, will be there. And so that's okay. So don't get me wrong that I'm, I'm not knocking on that. I'm just saying the, the, what it boils down to is what you said, though, is that what we see in scriptures is the pastors are still the ones accountable yeah, yeah. for, uh, you know, the things that are happening there. And so, you know, it's to be led by the pastors. They're accountable for the people there. It doesn't mean they don't have deacons and other people that help and structure and things like that. Yeah. No, but what I meant was there's a lot of, there's certain situations where some people, the, the committees get involved and, well, what are we going to be teaching and, and why are you saying that? And that's where it gets wrong because, if here, I mean, it keeps up saying, it says, let them do this with joy and mm. not with grief. Good. For this would be unpro unprofitable for you. Right on so cue, bro. Next slide. If a pastor is doing it with joy, he's in the Word. Yeah. Because that grief would be, like, forced to teach, right? Or or just, you know, not, whatever, trying to take credit for something that is belongs to God, right? Yeah. Because, well, I mean, think about it. What is the author saying here? You know, like you said, let them do it this way because it would not be an advantage for you to do it the other way. Uh, saying that we should be a joy to our pastors, um, not a burden to, to the pastors, knowing 
as he says, knowing that they keep watch over your souls. And so we talked a lot about that two weeks ago and the idea of watchmen. And we looked at Ezekiel and, you know, just the one who stands watching and, and standing guard and watching over and protecting. And remember the, the call out of the warning and that you're accountable for it and, and all those things. Um, you know, and so I think, I think I even skipped ahead two weeks ago and left off with kind of a couple questions to say, you know, um, are, uh, you know, are your are your leaders and pastors if if you were to ask them and they were to answer honestly you know do you make them glad or do you make them groan and i think that's a, a pretty you know on point question to ask yourself in light of what we're seeing right here uh if if you should do it with joy and not groaning or that you want them to pastor you and shepherd you with joy and not groaning then that has a lot to do with us, right? With with you, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? Because what what does that look like then for you? What, what does that mean for application maybe for us? What does that look like? So, so uh-huh. to the passive and, and, and being helpful and being uh, part of the flock, not, not like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, but like a sheep in sheep's clothing. You know? Yeah. Being, a, being one of the flock and, and, and being, yeah, I can do that. I can do what you asked me to do because I want to, you know. Taking the attention off yourself, mm-hmm. putting it back on the, on the flock. And also, if, if there's joy, we give you joy, that means that we are growing. Mm. So there's a growth. I'm sure you can have a beginner, they're going to give you a little grief, but you know, they're, they're lost. When I first came to God, I had more questions than answers. Yeah. But, uh, we all do. Yeah. We still do. <laughs> we all did. Yeah. Well, now, now we have more, you know, deeper questions. Right? Yeah. And I think we're all we're going to be up there in heaven, I think, asking asking away. Right. You know, I, I pray we're able to have a, a big Q&A session. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I think, you know, as you said that, Jose, I'm just thinking of a, you know, as we already alluded to, the, you know, the household structure. And so, you know, thinking about... You know, any of us who are fathers and thinking about our children, you know, you think about your children when they're young, they ask a lot of questions. They need a lot of guidance. They need a lot of oversight. They need a lot of protection, right? And so maybe that's a a good picture um, for us to look at, uh, remembering that we were babes and we were on milk. But, you know, as Paul says, grow up, mature, become men and, you know, and or women, you know, in in the sense of if you have daughters, uh, that those they're going to grow up, you know, and, and so we need to be teaching them. And you know, Proverbs twenty two, you know, talking about train up a child the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. You know, Ephesians uh, saying, you know, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, you know, but raise them up in the uh, admonition, you know, in the ways of the Lord. Um, and so, you know, there's a responsibility going back again to the father being the priest and the shepherd, the under shepherd of the household. Um, you know, maybe you can draw a parallel of that to pastors and you know and church members uh same type of same type of relationship you know if we can draw a little parallel not the same exactly obviously but um you know just a a parallel maybe that can be made there um that that it's an application point for all of us who may be fathers or or maybe your time of a father is is past and your you know children are older or you don't have children um you know it's it's still um applicable in the sense of of church here but um yeah thoughts on that any other thoughts or inputs on that i think um like a lot of times and there's nothing wrong with it but we always go to church to you know hear the word you know and hear a message but you know, I go to like a little church in Layton, and you know, there's still so much need, you know, whether it be just like putting the announcements up or you sure. know, doing stuff like that. And Amen. I think that's one way to help like the leaders of a church, you know, to grow and to build. And Good. Honestly, too, you said it like as a leader of any stature, you know, for God, you're going to be held more responsible and you're going to be on the enemy's radar, you know, that much more. So, like, I think prayer is like a great way to to like you know yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let's let's bathe it all in prayer. I agree. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, please add me to that bath. Yeah, anytime you're praying, I, I will take it. Um, yeah, it's a uh, good point. Yeah, good point. Whatever the hat is that you wear, and that's kind of what we've been talking about with this next study we've been talking about now for a while. Um, you know, we're, the next study is going to be kind of spiritual leadership in the home. But, you know, even if you don't have children or you're not married, uh, we're going to be talking about all the hats that we wear, you know, in different roles that still have responsibility and you're still called to be uh, a man of God in each of those, you know, places. And so, yeah, good, good point. Thank you, Justin. I mean, think about it though. Where's the best training place? At home? Yeah. No, I mean, cause if, you, if you're able to succeed at home or, or try at it, that's going to that's gonna help you to go out. And, oh. and then when you go to work, you can talk to somebody. There's a, I used to sit there and talk to a lot of people, and I just asked God, put somebody in my Just put somebody in today. Give me, and I find just that one person that, that is open, that's, that's broken, you know? Because when people are broken, is when. I remember when I was broken, that's when I, you know, kind of just like gave everything up. Okay, let me, let me start paying attention. Yeah, and, and to your point, Joe, I mean, the, the, yeah, the family, the home, I mean, it's where it definitely needs to start, where it needs to be focused. Um, you know, even for me as a pastor, I mean, my first place of ministry is my home, yep. not here. Um, well, that's one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the, what do you call the? Well, I think you're going exactly where my so Timothy, training. yeah. Yes. So Timothy and Titus are, that's yes. the, you know, if you get your, fa- your family has to be in order. You have to, you are, yeah. I think it's your children, right? Yeah, about your I would say you're included. Yeah, your whole household. Yeah, and you're talking about the um, qualifications. qualifications yes, right. of <laughs> of being a pastor, and so that's a great point to bring in here. That uh, we're going to talk a lot about that in the next study too. You know, that as a leader and as the pastors, uh, yeah, I mean, you're it's it's a prerequisite and a qualification that you've got to you know you need to be doing well in the home first. So it's always going to start in the home. You know, even for pastors, if it's if if you're not doing it well in the home, you're not going to do it. You know, you're not really qualified. Um, it's a high calling. It is. Just to be a man. It is. You know, that's it's right. Easy to look like, you know, look look the part from the outside, but to be a man is is. I, I do just what I can to get by as a man. Yeah. You know, like, <clears throat> but to be a, a real man, a leader, and and. Yeah. A godly man. Yeah, man. Hey, man, I'm I'm looking forward to it already. That's what we're gonna be talking about next yeah. study. Yeah, and, and yeah. we're talking about it now, so don't don't stop. Yeah, yeah. 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 but I'm looking forward to it. To the world, we're a bunch of weird people. Yeah. We're, not, we're no near what a man is supposed to be well, to the world. Well, that's a good point because even Great as you point. even as you said that, you know, if you had secular minds in here listening, they wouldn't even take what you said as we take it. Right. You know, because I know you mean to say a man of God. Right. You know, being a man of God is a high calling, and being a man that God has called me to be is a big deal yeah and it's a high calling and you're right it is yeah it is and so as we kind of wrap up there verse 17 you know we wrap up those three things that that we've looked at the last few weeks and uh you know he lists these couple things here emphasizing how uh our doing them is a is a pleasing sacrifice you know as it says there um to god and then i have uh chapter 6 verse 10 noted here so i'm gonna go back and read that real quick it says for god is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as in all you do and so um you know just again that kind of ties in the romans 12 thing we we're talking about before that all the things that we do should be a pleasing sacrifice to god that we should be living a life you know think again of paul's words ephesians 4 i think um you know, live a life worthy of the calling by which you've been called. Then he says in Philippians, you know, live a life worthy of the gospel. Uh, and so that that right there is a high bar, <laughs> right? That's a high calling. Live a life worthy of it. Um, we're going to struggle and we're going to fail, but we're to strive to live a life worthy you know, of these things. I'm always impressed how God rewards effort. <clears throat> He he can he makes success. We don't yeah. have to be successful. Yeah. We just have to show up and try. Yeah. Obey. Yeah. Do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think too, as you say that in my brain, you know, I think going back to that whole, you know, secular 
versus up, you know, believers, it's a whole different dynamic for one versus the other as far as being successful. You know, but, right. You know, as believers, being successful is, you know, doing their best to, you know, to bring the gospel to others and to be that living sacrifice for Christ and to do, you know, to help one another out and pray for one another. Whereas, yeah. you know, and that's spiritually uplifting and that's rewarding and successful for us. Yes. You know, for someone who has no clue about that, you know, their success is how much money they have or how many properties they have. Or, right. You know, all the that monetary stuff. Yes. You know? Yes. There's an old... Uh, <clears throat> I listen to a lot Different of older standards. people talk to me, and you know, even they, even sec- secular people, they say something kind of. There's one guy that says, uh, he says, "How do you measure success, Joe?" And I'm like, "No, oh. I was like, you know, he caught me off guard." Goes, You're like, "Is this a knock knock joke?" Yeah. <laughs> and he says, "The way you measure success is with the size of smile in your wife's face." Yeah. So if you know that's smile. smile. Yeah. And then here's another thing that we left out. I don't know if you, when we're talking about uh, let them do it with, uh, with joy and not in grief, for this will be unprofitable for you. Yes. What does that mean? Because if they do it with grief, they're not going to be telling you the, the full word. So you're going to be, you could be fogged. Well, I, so let's, yeah, let's paint a picture grief. here. Start with grief. Yeah, let's paint a picture or scenario of, you know, a church, you know, member or regular tender, whatever you want to call it, somebody that goes to church, uh, but maybe is, you know, just weathered, uh, you know, through their life and is hardened by maybe past hurts that they've had in the church from hurts in the world, hurts in their family. You know, I don't know what the scenario may be. We're just drawing it up. But, you know, maybe they have lost their joy and it's been a long time and they're very hardened and, and you know, that's how they speak to the pastors or to the elders or they don't, uh, you know, they're just kind of always being, uh, you know, a nuisance or always in the sense of, you know, they're always judgmental maybe or um, coming at the pastor very hard and judging them and holding them to too high of a standard or that they'll never meet that standard no matter what they do. And this is reality because we're human beings. This is a reality for me as a pastor that that's the case with people. But, But so I would say to you, but it's, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but ain't that talking about the pastor? Let them do this with joy and not with grief? Is he talking about the pastor? Yes, because, so that's what the picture I'm painting for you. So if that person, how do you think that person, if they were always like that to you as a pastor, how would that make you feel? Oh, I thought it was the opposite. I, I think it's it talking about the pastor not having any grief. No, it's saying let the pastors, let let the pastors be joyful that they are shepherding you. Don't let them be grieving or groaning that they're shepherding you. Because, see, Joe, that's why it would not be profitable for you. So in the scenario that I'm talking about, it would be this person is a thorn in my side. So every time I think about this person, because remember, I'm still a human being too, it causes me to... You know, I, I see their fo- their name come up on my phone, and I'm like, oh, right. you know, what just like, it's it's just become, it's not a joy for me to pastor you. It's it's groaning for me to see your name pop up on my phone. And so it's saying, Joe, don't have your pastor react like that, because that's not profitable for you. Is it good for you to have me see that and be like, yeah, I don't, go to voicemail. You know what I mean? Like, it's not good for you to have a shepherd who feels that way about you. I just don't <laughs> And when you get off the phone with that person and the next person calls, it's not <laughs> profitable for that person because now you're in a bad mood and you're not yeah. going to be as, yeah. you know, into it. So it's not profitable for us collectively. Yeah. For anyone, right? right. And so, so going to, back to Joe, what you were saying, I would say even, I think Steve pointed this out on Zoom, I remember um, a couple of weeks ago when we ended here to say, so we're doing a lot of repeating, but I think we're unpacking other things too, which is great. Um To say that as a pastor, you know, what then, too, on the other side of that coin, you know, how can I make it better for the people I'm shepherding to be joyful and and not groaning? You know what I mean? So this thing goes two ways, right? There's two sides to this coin of how how Joe treats me and, and makes should desire for me to be joyful to pastor him. 
I also should be shepherding Joe in a way that makes him joyful that it's me who's shepherding him, <laughs> right? Like this thing should be a two-sided kind of synergistic thing, shouldn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. I definitely see like the sheep's side of this because I can think of like how many past employers I've had that are have grown every time they even like think of me, you know? <laughs> Just because of, like, really, like, being that thorn, like... Are Daniel's you, are, not here to give an amen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah. Well, not here. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, but... Uh, it's being recorded. I'll send it to him later. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, 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 no. You're it's making funny. a good point. That, no, but I, I just, like... I don't know. I was going somewhere with that. You were saying that, you know, there's employers that would think the same of you, that you made right. them groan. And, and being uh, under them. Yeah, and I think it's just like, are you lifting up? Are you are you are you speaking life over this, or are you just adding to the negative? I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, your your words, you know, your tongue is sharp. You know, the Bible yeah. says, and it has the power to give life or bring death. Exactly. Yeah, you know, and let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Uh, you know, but only use words that are for edifying, like you just said, building up. Yeah. Hey, Craig. Yeah, Scott. Um, do you think it maybe speaks to like what a pastor does is he's he's shepherding you through the Bible and through the gospel in the way that was given, you know, for him to he basically helps us to understand the Bible and the scriptures, you know, the truth that we're reading out of, and you read it and you help us to understand it. And I can't help but think of how many warnings and, and directions that the Bible has in here for us. You know, the Bible pretty much lays it all out there. It's not like Craig telling us, yes, you should do this, you should do that. No, it's Craig telling you, listen, the Bible says you should do this. That's you right. Do that. You yeah. know what I mean? So basically, you know, if, if, if you cover a topic and, you know, and a person's not getting it because you see them, you know, the fruit isn't there, you know, over and over again. That, I think that speaks to that, too. You know, let them do this without groaning because you're groaning because I've, I've, I've tried to explain this to you over and over again. But yet it seems like we're not getting it, you know. Yeah, understood. Good. No, good point. You know, um, good point. Like, uh, we, I think we're like that's trying. your fruit. That's your action. Like, uh, what is it? The works. That yeah. they were speaking of just before, you know. Good. If your works are showing that you're not doing what the Bible is instructing you to do, which is what the pastor is helping you to try to understand, you know, it's not that you don't understand it; it's because you're not doing it. <laughs> it's your sinful side that fights you, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely uh, that disconnect that we all have to some degree, um, right in this flesh, and until we uh, are in the Lord's presence, that. We know, uh, yeah, I mean, think of Romans 7. Uh, that's, you know, Romans 7 is where Paul talks about, you know, I know the right things to do, and yet I don't do it. And the things that I hate, that I know are not right, I still do those things. Uh, and so I think we all know, get that as I see everybody nodding. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we all know, um, you no, know, it's that. There. It's waiting for you. Yeah, you, you look, we're, we're, as we talk through, you might want to use this in your Roman study. It's, I think it's a good line. I stole it from somebody, so you can steal it. Uh, but, you know, Romans 7, uh, the deal is as we're studying through Romans, it's like you're going to spend, you think I spend some time going through, you know, studies. You're going to spend the rest of your life in Romans chapter 7. I mean, that's just a fact. Sheep, shepherd, pastor, whoever you are, father. I mean, that's... The reality is, yep, the things I hate, I still do. The things I hate to think about, I still think about. The things that I know I should think about, I don't enough. The things that I know I should do, I don't do them. Uh, and that's Paul saying that. <laughs> so, and ending with, what a wretched, what a wretched man, man I, am. I am. You know, that's right. Because that's the reality is, yep, the conclusion I have is, I'm just a wretch. And, and I'm a terrible person. And so, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound to say to a wretch like me. You know what? Also, that's a that's a that's a good point. Our bodies, we live in our bodies. That's like if you drive, you could be the nicest guy, the best pastor out there. You drive a 1973 AMC or AMX, whatever, with different colored doors and different. I size do need a tires. new car. What I'm saying is, 
that's that, that's our body that that's our reflection that's what that's the sin that's the temptation we get yeah. daily we live it's a spirit living in this body and this body is not designed to <laughs> to be holy holy you know as God is. yeah that's why it's not permanent that's praise not Jesus permanent. I mean that's actually an act of mercy you know, that we won't suffer in these bodies part. with sin forever. That's actually, actually an act like of mercy. 19, actually, I use a 1972 Gremlin, you know? <laughs> yeah. I know, I saw yeah. Pete. Uh, I was just thinking, is it what, what, like, as we have this whole thing is, again, I'm, I'm just a, like a single soul of me, but, you know, but basically I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like we're all trying to put this thing together like this IKEA furniture. Yeah. And you got to read the instructions, and the instructions are there they are, you know, and we're not. You know, when you try and do it without instructions, yeah. it all goes terribly wrong. And, and There's always right. extra pieces, man. But it's, Step know, one. But there isn't if you actually look at Scripture and back Scripture up with Scripture. Yeah. Mm. All the pieces are there. That's right. And you can put them all in the right spot, but we're too busy, like, trying to shove them all over the place. And it's, yeah. You know. Good. Is that too? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, it kind of um, speaks to, like, the expectation that we should have on each other. You know, I feel like sometimes we're a little too expectant and, you know, we need to correct each other with, you know, gentleness, kindness, and love. And I feel like sometimes whenever we're being transparent with one another, maybe a pastor is, just has a little bit higher of an expectation. You know, like, man, you should really get through this by now, you know, mm. and that could right. oftentimes lead yeah. to groaning. Whereas, yes. you know, we're, we've all started in different, you know, areas of life. And, you know, we're all struggling with different things. And, yep. You know, we're all uniquely and wonderfully made. And I think if we just make sure we're always, like, OD with love, you know. You know, it says love covers a multitude of sins. So Amen. love is always, like, the most important thing. And First Peter 4, I get one of my favorites. you love first, you know, yes. then I think the groaning will go away. Yeah, good. Grace, love. Yeah, again, prayer, all the things you've mentioned there, Justin. Yeah, those are things that we should be heavy in. And like I said, I mean, if we're going to always err, on the you know let's always err on the side of grace yeah. and love you know yeah uh, which is you know verse one again let brotherly love continue you know do do those things yeah, yeah. I was just listening to the um, you know the woman that was caught in adultery and everybody's like let's stone her yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, stone her and that's a great one the, who he was to cast the first stone go ahead you know yeah, if, you've, if you've never sinned you know yeah. They all screwed off, and then Jesus is saying, "So now, what's he going to do? He's going to chop her up, or what's he going to? Is this go and sin no more?" Yeah. Sort of so simple, and, right? But yeah, so complex too, you know. That's and right. It started with the the when he said that to them, uh, the, uh, throw the first stone. It says that the the young the young ones were the ones that dropped the stone first, right? Oh, right, it went like the youngest to the oldest. So, yeah, so the oldest guy is thinking around, well, you know, I think he got it, you know, like, you know, that's... Well, the oldest has got more reasons not to throw the stone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They, should, they should have been the first ones out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Good stuff. Good things. Yeah, it speaks a lot to, like, the heart of, like, humans, you know, because just as you're in this world for, you know, longer and longer, your heart hardens and hardens yeah. and hardens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but yep. that would be an unbeliever, right? Like, Even as a believer. Well, believers too. No, no, because like you're living in a world of, of flesh and sin, yeah. and like yeah. you're trying to live this life, like it. Yeah, but the well, I mean, it, it's different. I think that the law, if, if the more you get to know God and the more you are into His Word, yes. I would think the person would be a little bit more, 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 more wiser, more. We should be, and I think yeah, I mean, compared I, to... I, I get your point, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, until the real trials kick in. You know, yeah, I and I think, I think Joe, you know, as in comparison, you're right. You know, certainly yeah. uh, the believer shouldn't be near as bad as the unbeliever. But, yeah, I mean, you, that's what we just talked about with Romans 12. You know, be not conformed to the things of this world. Why? Because you're going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be that you are probably going to be conformed to the things of this world. <laughs> Why does he say don't do it? Because you're going to have a tendency to conform to the things of this world. I mean, just take a status report of, of the quote-unquote church, because a lot of them, I would say, are not churches, um, you know, that believe in liberal theology and a lot of those things that just aren't really theology. But the point I'm trying to make is just how you've seen secularism, 
infiltrate the churches, uh, you know, that the church has conformed to the ways of this world. Uh, you know, that they're um, marrying homosexuals and uh, just on and on and on with the list. You know, there's no sanctity of marriage in, in a lot of these places that, that again, aren't, those aren't churches. But they call themselves churches and there are these places where people go and they think it's a church and they think they're hearing, you know, the message of the Bible and yet there's no sanctity of marriage, there's no sanctity of life, there's no sanctity for any of the order that God has created. And so we shouldn't be dumbfounded by these things. The Bible tells us that these <coughs> things are going to happen and that we need to guard. You know, why does he tell us guard against these things? Because these things are going to happen. Think about Paul as he says... You know, on my departure, I know that when I leave, wolves, ravenous wolves are going to come in from amongst you, he says. He doesn't say when I leave, you know, that that swindler down, you know, in Ephesus is going to come over, you know, uh, he's going to come from Macedonia and come over here to Ephesus and he's going to get in here. He says, from within you. So from within this church, there's going to be wolves that come by when I leave because they know I'm not here to protect you. Like, He's, this is the expectation. Wow. That's deep. You know? That's, deep. Yeah. that's the reality that Paul speaks to, that the scriptures speak to. That's so why not everybody's saved in the church. No. What's that? I'm that's why there's so many branches. <laughs> yes, guy. I just think that's why there's so many different branches of religion, I think, because of apostate. There's a lot of them that are apostate that yeah. have fallen away. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> Yeah. Or corruption, yeah. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Well, we have eight minutes. I'm not going to go on to verse 18. Uh, we will pause there and stop there, and we'll start there next week. Ain't that where we ended up last week? Yep. I mean, two weeks ago, actually. <laughs> two weeks ago. I see this. Hey, you, y'all did it. I, I'm just going to where y'all go. Oh, you know? thanks, leader. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to blame somebody. <laughs> Didn't we just talk about that? <laughs> I'm just getting a bit confused. Am I a human no, or a sheep? <laughs> uh, we di- we digress so quickly, but we do have eight minutes, you know, to talk about the reality of this and application. And, yeah, certainly it's fun, but, you know, we, we did a lot of review. But I think we unpacked and talked about a lot, of, a lot more things tonight than, you know, than we did two weeks ago uh, that are applicable. You know, and I just, I'm always going to find comfort in Peter saying it is good for me to remind you the things that you already know. So I'm just going to keep reminding you. <laughs> I'm going to keep you know, reminding we're not me. Here, but we're not here and we're at work. I mean, honestly, you know, there's not, I, I don't know, maybe Joel, Joel, remember he used to come here? They, they, I invited him once and he came to his family. He, he used to be a pastor. We were the only ones at work that we looked at each other he and I was like, man, you got it. He goes, no, Joe, you got it. We figured it out. We, you know, we're talking deep things and everybody else, so what I'm trying to get to is that we go to work and we hang out with these people that are, hopefully they're Christians, but we can't have the conversation that we have here during a lunch break, you know? Sure. So I work with three Jehovah Witnesses and there's like 15 or 20 in the whole so Excuse they me. they try to you know we, we have conversations you know this and that and but it, it I feel so not outnumbered it's just out but they don't are. have the wisdom I got they don't they don't they've been talking behind my back about uh, the the end days you know and I hear them talking and what's up you think it was yesterday the day before we we're talking about on Friday and it's not all because this is you know like that like oh you mean like a thief in the night huh. And they're like, yeah, how do you, what do you know about that? You know, are yeah. you Christian? And then, and I go, well, you know, you got to keep on reading it. Yeah. And they, they, they told me, oh, yeah, you know, that's for the people not, that are not on the watch. Yeah. So they, they, they have some things that they go with. Right. But, you know, when it comes to Jesus, they like, they don't even want to hear it. They, oh, yeah. he, he's a prophet. He's whatever. Sure. Like, so to get back to what I'm trying to say, we if we don't come here and have these deep discussions here and we agree or don't agree, we're not learning. We're not growing because, you know, I might be wrong about something and then you say something and he says something and like like what you said about it's hard to be a, a, a man of God. And it is. It is. I mean, I get slammed every day with, and I, I what's wrong? I'm going to say something like, oh, I shouldn't say that. And I'm not, you know, I, I just leave, you know, because, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of sexual things. And where I work out these guys, 
there's one guy there that he can tell me, I'm talking, we're walking, and whatever, and some girl passes by, he's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah. and he's like, he, you know, he's a man of God. Yeah. yeah. Even women say, oh, your friend creeps me out. I go, hey, he's just a, he's just a worker. <laughs> I'm not like, oh, that's the worst, dude. That's the worst. I don't even like being, I don't even like that gouge your eyes out people, scripture, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear Sky? Maybe you should share the gouge your eyes out scripture with him. Lucky yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Check> it out. <laughs> hey, you want me to get that eye for you? <laughs> hey, you're a man of God. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Can I say something about Jehovah's Witnesses? Sure. So, um, I had a worker once who was a Jehovah's Witness. And um, so, like, in reality, they're supposed to be really good doers of the word, right? You know, because they believe in, you know, like, work stuff. You know, works, yeah, work. yeah, yeah, they're, they're all about works, works. Right? but they don't believe in Jesus, so I kind of, I had a worker, he was a Jehovah's Witness, and I kind of took it to God, and, you know, this is how I brought it up to him, so he, they don't believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man, right? right. Yep. So I brought it up to him, I was like, so you believe in Adam and Eve, and you believe, you know, that Adam, you know, made the apple, yada, 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 and that humanity's cursed, you know, from that, and every human has sin, right? There's right. no human without sin. But who's the only human who's without sin? And, Jesus. you know, Jesus. So, how could he do that if he was not fully God? Or, or fully man, because he had to take our place to go, it's just like the, the so, Virgin Mary. Yeah. There's no way that the, the, the Mary could be holy, because if Mary was holy, and the Spirit of God is holy, and they both had Jesus, and Jesus would be holy, and he would never take on the, the true flesh. You know what I'm saying? Because it's all, you could be holy, if you're holy, you have to be spiritual. Christ took on, Christ was, Christ came through a woman that was a sinner, just like us, yep. and was able to be converted and have the man, the, you know, the, the genes of a human man to come into the world to say, okay, here I am, Satan. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to be perfect, and I'm going to die for my people. Because you need both. You need to have the lineage of man to, you know what I'm saying, how can you erase something or how can you take something away from man or clean us of sin if you were never a man? Does that make sense? Yeah. Th I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to this rabbit trail. We could go down. <laughs> yeah. saying, There's yeah. a lot to He's why the virgin right. birth and yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. cutting off the Which, line, you know. Yeah, because if, if, then that's why I got friends of mine that are they oh, Mary is holy. And I'm like, no, no. She's, she is uh, blessed among women, not above. Yeah, but she was blessed because she was chosen by God exactly. to birth Amen. the Messiah. To, to be a yeah. right. That's but right. she was not holy. Because no. there's only three that no. are holy, the Bible yeah. says. No, yeah, so she certainly... And a, a lot of religions have that wrong, you know. You like that, yeah. I like that verse. Yeah. For there are three that bear a record in heaven. Yeah. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these yeah, and so, you know, maybe closing with some more application, you know, for us. Uh, we are going to struggle. Oh, he didn't say anything. He just what? he just kind of took it in, and he didn't say anything. So, I don't know, maybe one day. Hey, may the Lord use what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely had a many discussions with Yeah, and then I would get out of here. <laughs> yeah. No. I think that would be the road. If you, um, yeah. if you cut and paste the word, which is definitely big word warnings about doing that, that's, they're just like any other call. They cut and sure. paste in the word, that's all. Sure. Um, just taking a few words of it, all that, and yeah. put it together and make it their own. Sure. Yeah. And God said, if you deny me in front of men, I will deny you. Yeah, and, and that's that, the key, that be, you guys, you know, to circle back around to the good works and the things that we're called to do. I mean, yeah, we're called to have conversations like you have Justin's sharing, and, is you know, if we can do it uh, in kindness and in loving way, then, you know, may, may God use, uh, God may choose to use that to open the eyes of someone and save them, you know, because it's not, obviously, we're not just here picking on Jehovah's Witness. I mean, we could go across the board of every single other religion. Don't forget the more. On the on the planet, that's what I mean. We could go to every religion there is, um, you know, to say to say it it isn't truth because there's only one true religion, you know, and that is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And um, you know, if if we don't have that, then we don't have it. And so, um, you know, may God be gracious to us as we try to 
uh, share that with people because it's hard, man. When when you have people who've been uh, raised up and trained up in the ways that they have been that aren't the ways of the Lord and are false religions and things, it's it's hard because they believe their belief system also. It's just like the so, Jews with the sacrifice thing. Hundred percent. Like they were, their whole lineage in life. That's right. Up to that point was. Good point. A certain way and yeah, the baggage is real, and everybody you're out there talking to has some baggage, whether it's Jehovah's Witness, a Catholic, you know, whatever it is. Uh, they claim to be an agnostic, an atheist. You know, everybody has the baggage, and so, uh, and so did you, and so did I, and so, you know, by God's grace, He drew us out of that, you know, and, and granted us wisdom, granted us repentance, granted us faith, and. Uh, brought us to, you know, a true understanding of life, you know, and, and what it is. And so uh, he is able to do that. May he, uh, may he choose to use uh, wretches like us to do that. Yeah. And that's, that's the amazing part of the mystery, you know, of the ministry of reconciliation, is that, you know, Paul in Second Corinthians 5 there talking about that, it's, you know, that God is pleading with the world through us, be reconciled to God. So it, you know, it's our job to go out there and to beg people is what that means, to plead with people, to share it with them and, and say, be reconciled to God, you know. Um, so, all right, well, it is uh, that time. Uh, Jay, would you mind closing for us, brother? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this teaching, Lord. A city set upon a hill, hmm. Lord, cannot be hidden. That's no right. one lights a lamp and places it under a basket. That's right. And, uh, let us, Lord, be a light, therefore. Mm -hmm. Be a light to the world, so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father yes, in heaven. Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother.